Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second day of our missions conference. It is a joy to be. It was a joy to be with you last night as we got to um, hear a little bit from Jamal and just again that the Lord is working mightily. So, we're going to begin our time with singing. Um, please stand. We often don't know how the Lord will use um, things, both big and small, in our lives. So we would just only pray that God would use everything. We know that He does. Let's sing together. He leadeth me, O blessed thought. trust him with everything in our body and in our soul and mind to know that he brings us to himself. Let's say, take my life and let it be. 
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to day two of the Southside Bible Church Missions Conference for 2022. Living missionally, multiply it locally, reach globally. We've been blessed with some wonderful speakers already. Um, Nick did an awesome job last night if you weren't here. It was uh, such a blessing to see how the Lord has uh, matured him. Uh, my name is Paul Steenblock. I have the privilege of serving on the missions committee here at Southside, and I'm excited to see all of your faces this morning on a rainy Saturday morning. Um, I was a little bit concerned that the weather might keep some people away, so really encouraged that you guys are here. Um, we want to pray for, we've had a bit of a change in our schedule. Our schedule that was up there showed that uh, Brendan McMillan would be speaking in the next slot, and he's had a family emergency and is unable to join us today. So we've uh, done some switching around, and uh, Ryan Gold, who's going to speak in a moment here, is going to take the morning slot, and then uh, Rick, our own Rick Callahan is going to take the uh, second slot after we do the video call, after Ryan's message. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, we are going to have lunch today after the session, um, so hopefully you've signed up for that, and we want to welcome everybody for that as well. I um, want to uh, open in prayer this morning and then introduce Ryan with a, a quick intro. Father, we ask your blessing upon this time. Lord, this is a time set aside to remember your great commission, to remember your care and your desire to see some from every tribe, tongue, and nation worship before your throne. Lord, Every one of us is the fruit of missionaries who are faithful at some point in history. The various places that we all come from, the countries, we're all pagan, and faithful missionaries went and preached the gospel and died, that our peoples now might know you and do the same, to share that love to reach out to other nations who haven't heard, and to exalt your name over all the earth. Lord, we invite you to this day's session. We pray that you would do an awesome work in people's hearts to reveal your glory to them, that they might catch a vision of who you are, exalted. Lord, I pray that you would bless our speakers today, that you would be magnified, glorified, and that today's session and tomorrow, and last night even, would bear great fruit that your kingdom might be expanded and magnified. Lord, bless our time this day. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to introduce our next speaker, Ryan Gold. If you were here last night, um, Excellent Q&A, really good, uh, encouraging answers, and I uh, really appreciated uh, just um, what he had to say. Really excited to hear from him today. Um, I took him aside last night and I said, how should I introduce you? And he said, just introduce me as somebody who has a, a new appreciation for God's grace each day. Wow, that's what I wanna hear. So Ryan, join us. It's a delight to be with you this morning. Um, this church holds a very special place in our hearts. Just a little bit about me, so you can have a little bit more than that. I, I um, married my wife July 7, 2001, and Ken married us up in Kalispell, Montana. And then we spent our first year of marriage here before going off to seminary. And um, during seminary, my mom passed away, and... Uh, Ken and the elders here and the body here so faithfully helped her run her last few laps before she entered glory. One of my most dearest remembrances of that time of losing my mom was she passed away at like 2.30 in the morning, February 27, 2005. And we were up all night long. And then I had a, a knock at the door at about 8.30 and it was Ken. And we went up and just sat by her hospice bed where they left a hymnal and a rose, and we just discussed and gloried in the gospel and that God had 
taken her faithfully to glory. And so just such a sweet body you have here, and it's just such a privilege to, to be a part of this conference as unworthy, truly as I feel, to be speaking at it, and so thankful to be here this morning. If you'd please stand with me for the reading of God's Word. This is just what I typically do. I pastor a small church in Highlands Ranch, New Covenant Community Church. And if you would turn to 1 Timothy 2, we're just going to be going over this chapter this morning, spending most of our time in the first seven verses, and then briefly uh, in the rest of the chapter, and a brief summary over uh, chapter 3. So don't get nervous if 40 minutes in, we're still like on verse 6. We will get through it. Paul writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, 1 Timothy chapter 2, first of all then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am telling the truth. I'm not lying. A teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place the men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness. I do not permit a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not the one deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing if they continue in faith and love and holiness with self-control. And so concludes the reading of God's inerrant, infallible, authoritative, eternal, and sufficient word. May he give us not only ears to hear what we just read, but hearts that respond to the truths therein. You may be seated. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this time. We bow in holy solemnity before your word that is as pure as silver refined in the furnace seven times. And I pray you'd feed your sheep this morning. And I pray that you would call people to the mission field. And I pray that, God, you would purify your church for a pure church is a powerful sending force to the globe of your glory and what we do in these hours and what Southside and New Covenant Community Church and gospel preaching churches throughout this city and this nation will do tomorrow has an impact on our outreach of proclaiming and teaching the gospel of your son to every tribe and tongue and nation. Lord, help us to see through this text this morning the connection between ecclesiology and missiology, between the preciousness of your bride, the local church, and reaching the nations. Exalt your son. Fill me with your spirit. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people in agreement said, in 1785, William Carey became the pastor of a tiny Baptist church. It was his first pastorate, and while he was there, he concluded from his own studies in the scriptures that foreign missions were primarily responsible by the local church. The local church was responsible to send missionaries. 
This idea, you got to understand, in 1785 was revolutionary in Carey's day. As the great majority of churchmen held the position that the Great Commission was only for the apostles, Jesus 12, and that evangelizing other nations was not their job in the 18th century. When Carey had an opportunity to to share what he had studied before a group of pastors in England, presenting the biblical case, case to reach the peoples of the globe to a group of pastors, one replied to him, young man, sit down. When God pleases to convert the heathen, he will do it without our help. He will do it without your help. But thankfully, William Carey would not shut up. So that when he sat down, he wrote a book defending his position entitled An Inquiry into the Obligation of Christians to Use Means for the Conversion of the Heathens. And from this conviction found in this book, this 87-page book or so, the Baptist Missionary Society was formed. And Carey is still known today in missiology and church history as the father of modern missions. I want to demonstrate this morning from 1 Timothy 2, from a pastoral epistle, the truth of William Carey's thesis. And that is this, missions begins in the local church. Missions begins in the local church. We will look in detail at 1 Timothy 2 verses 1 through 7 and then conclude briefly with a flyover of verse 8 of chapter 2 verse through verse 13 of chapter 3. I want to break down basically the summary of verse 1 through 7 with this sentence. And it will reflect the flow of Paul's thought in 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 7. And that sentence is this. Evangelistic prayer, if you want to write this down, if you're taking notes. Evangelistic prayer aims at religious liberty. Evangelistic prayer aims at religious liberty and is grounded in the gospel of our God. Let me say that again. Evangelistic prayer aims at religious liberty and is grounded in the gospel of our God. Let's look at verses one and two. Evangelistic prayer aims at religious liberty. First of all, in verses one through two, in the first part of chapter two, we're going to see the priority of praying for a lost humanity. The priority of praying for a lost humanity. Global missions is found in verse One, where Paul writes, first of all then, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people. Notice he says, first of all, he's saying Timothy, who's a pastor in his early 30s in Ephesus. Timothy, what I'm about to say is a high priority for the local church. That's why he says, first of all, what I'm about to say is important as far as your leadership of Christ's flock. And then he says, I urge you. This is the same verb in Romans 12, 1 and 2, after Paul finishes his enormously unmatched explanation of the gospel. And he says, therefore, I urge you. The sense of this verb is somewhere between a request and a command. It is a earnest desire. Paul is saying to Timothy, we have such a close relationship. I don't need to order or command you to do this. But it's from an earnestness. It's a priority. And then I want to stop just short of a commandment. I want to urge you in your leadership to do what? 
I want to urge you that supplications, prayers, and intercessions stop right there. John Calvin said about these three words, there's such an overlap of similarity between them. Paul's aim not, is not necessarily, and this is Calvin, the great expositor, is to rip apart every one of these three words, but to get this, warm your heart. Warm your sluggish heart by the Spirit's power to pray. Something that believers struggle to do anyway. I tell my congregation, prayer is like the cardio of the Christian life if you like exercise. And very few of us, I did a one mile run before I came to the conference yesterday. I'm 48 years old and I felt like I was dying. It's difficult, right? Prayer is like that. And Paul is giving these three words, supplications, prayers, intercession, to warm the hearts of the congregation at Ephesus to do one thing, pray, pray. Then he says, thanksgivings. This is a little bit different than the first three. This is, and I like this, we need to recapture this. This is confidence in advance for what God is going to do through prayer. What God is going to do through prayer. Prayer is partnering with the sovereignty of God. One of the best messages you can listen is go to t4g.org and listen to David Platt talking about prayer. Prayer is partnering with the sovereignty of God. And when we pray, we ask and thank God in advance that he is going to do things in accordance with his will. And notice what he says, on behalf of all people. Now, explicitly, this is global humanity. And implicitly, when he says, on behalf of all people, it's world evangelization. How do we know this? Because in verse 4, he uses the same two words, all people. And he, like a laser, focuses it on verse 4, on world evangelization. On behalf of all people. Why does he need to say all people, because the background of this book is twofold with two different groups who didn't think the body of Christ needed to reach all people. One was heretical. It was the false teachers. In chapter 1, verses 6 through 7, and 19 through 20, the false teachers, as they always were in the first century church, threatening the church, threatening the truth of God to either dilute it or distort it or get the church off their focus. And Paul is, and they like to just be exclusive as well as the Jews. They didn't have a heart for all people. They tended toward exclusivity. So to combat this, Paul wants the, <clears throat> excuse me, the congregation's prayers to take on a global scope. A global scope. This prevents local churches from becoming a family of the frozen chosen, which is very easy to do. And this is the horizontal aspect of our worship. It's first and foremost vertical to God, but God, just like the second greatest commandment says, as you worship me, pray for the nations. Love your neighbor by praying for them, your neighbor here and your neighbor across the ocean in other continents. One of my favorite illustrations of this foundational priority of a local church is, is legendary. Ken mentioned it last night before we prayed for Nick's message. And it reads as follows. <clears throat> Quote, five college students visited London one Sunday to hear Charles Spurgeon preach at the Metropolitan Tabernacle. They arrived early and were met by a kind gentleman who offered to give them a tour. At one point, he asked them if they would like to see the furnace room in the basement. It was a hot July day, and the students were not interested. But not wanting to appear rude, they consented. Their guide quietly opened the door, and there in the basement of the Metropolitan Tabernacle, there were several hundred people, 
fervently praying for the service that was about to begin. It was then <clears throat> that their guide introduced himself. He was none other than Charles Spurgeon himself. And he wanted these college students to understand that prayer was the power source of his ministry. Prayer truly is the power plant of the church. The furnace room is generally not a pleasant place, but it is the source of heat in a building. And behind any healthy church is a commitment to prayer. End quote. Amen. And we see that right after an introductory chapter right as he says, here's how you're to conduct the worship of the local church. Prayer. Prayer. And notice that local churches are responsible for loving our neighbors not only globally, but locally. Number two, we just looked at in verse one, globally, now we're gonna look at government leaders, verse two. He says, for kings and for all who are in high positions. We are to pray for government leaders' salvation and their stability and that for the stability of government under their rule. This has precedence in the Old Testament. Jeremiah 29, 7, it says, but seek, and this is written to exiles in Babylon, not their homeland, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf for in its welfare, you will find your welfare. Ezra 6.10, Cyrus's edict, if you know about Cyrus, he said, go back and build the temple, this pagan leader, and God uses him in amazing ways. And his edict says, being repeated in Ezra 6.10, pray for the king and his sons. Time doesn't permit us to look at the early church fathers who emphasized this in their writings, Tertullian, Clement of Rome, when Paul wrote this to a young pastor in his early 30s named Timothy, this was Nero and his court. But it's also for other nations. So the American church, just to apply it to us, doesn't just pray, <clears throat> excuse me, for our executive, legislative, and judicial branches, which we should, and the leaders in those but for Vladimir Putin of Russia, for Kim Jong-un of North Korea, for Vladimir Zelensky of Ukraine, for the newly elected prime minister of Great Britain, Liz Truss. See, yes, we are to pray. First, for our own national leaders. We're to pray for Governor Polis, just as someone in early Galilee might have pray, play, prayed for Pontius Pilate. So we're to pray for our own national and local, federal and state leaders for their salvation and for the stability of government and its rule. But let me remind you that we ultimately belong to an eternal nation state, as was mentioned last night. The kingdom of God, which you are a part of, which is political. Its king is Jesus and it's a body Politic and every little church is an embassy outpost of a coming rule and kingdom that you are a part of that eclipses even your citizenry here in the United States of America. I just want to remind you of that so that you pray for the leaders of other nations that your brothers and sisters are under. See, a church's mission's heart these first few verses are saying, is formed in her prayer meetings. May our boiler rooms in our local churches fire world evangelization. 
May we garner in those times of praying for your missionaries here like Nick and his sweet family and Rodney and his sweet family, but for that more would go from here, that that map out in the lobby would be littered with missionaries that once sat in the seats you sit in and could not sit still. They could not stay They had to go. They were compelled through their own quiet times privately and corporate times of worship. But I get ahead of myself. But don't forget those two close. Two. Don't forget those right here. In a local election this past June, I called up someone who was running for on office in Douglas County because I wanted to know his position on pro-life and I got the candidate himself. And he said, can I put my wife on speakerphone? And I said, I, I just want to know where you're at on that issue. And he was solid as a rock biblically on the issue. And I said, can I, can I pray for you? What a precious moment to pray with a man running for office and hear his tears and how touched he and his wife were. And I don't say that to exalt myself. These are real people with great burdens on their shoulders. And we need to intercede for them for revival in our government and revival in their own offices and staffs. But here's the purpose of this prayer. This may shock some of you, but I saw it years ago and had it confirmed as I read many commentaries. The purpose of this prayer, second part of verse two, is religious liberty. Religious liberty. Liberty, notice it says, why do we do this? That we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. What's Paul saying? Paul's saying, Paul wants us to pray evangelistically for the nations and our own nation states with the goal that we live lives characterized by tranquility. That's peaceful. Characterized by being well-ordered, that's quiet. Lives of genuine faith, that's godliness. And serious holiness, that's dignified. See, religious liberty allows for the public evangelistic witness of the gospel without fear. Let me say that again. Religious liberty allows for the public evangelistic witness of the gospel without fear. But notice what Paul is not saying. Two things I want to point out. Number one, he's not saying pray for your bureaucrats so that Christians might live in self-indulgent comfort. Did you hear that? Pray for your leaders, in other words, so you can live in the cocoon of your house. Sociologists said suburbia, several years ago, is like a cocoon. And people drive into their cocoon and shut the garage door and stay in their cocoon. This is not the point of religious liberty. This is not the point of why we pray for our leaders so we can live in our cocoon and enjoy Netflix and binge watch the most popular series and live in the comfort of suburbia and go to church but rarely think about the lost going to hell. This is not religious liberty. This is what is being tested in our day persecution coming, our motivations. See, a church, a local church, sees that living peacefully, orderly, in a godly and holy manner is the greatest base of, get this, operations for global missions. And that's why we should pray for candidates this November who defend religious liberty for the express purpose that they might continue, we might continue, believers might continue in this nation to share the gospel publicly without fear of civil penalty in our neighborhoods, in our workplaces, in the gyms we work out at, when our kids are involved in sports leagues to evangelize and family gatherings. Number two, Paul isn't saying, and this is, 
Let me qualify this. Don't get scared by me saying this. Paul isn't saying pray for persecution. He's saying, but rather pray leader, for leaders who will lead us by legislating and interpreting our laws in such a way that guards our religious freedom. You, you may have heard years ago, well, um, politics is just legislating morality. Politics is always legislating morality. The question is, whose morality is it? And we should pray for leaders that legislate according to God's explicit law and natural law, what he's written on the heart. Yet, that said, watching our nation's rapid moral decline and based on that, I think it's fair to wonder if the greater American church has neither been praying for the globe nor for our government leaders very fervently, nor truly using the immense freedom we have for aggressive evangelism. And I, in light of that, might the imminent persecution encroaching on our nation be God's discipline for our wrong priorities as, and I'm not picking on this church, I'm saying churches in general in America. And you might reject this assertion, but if you do, I want to ask you, how much of your week-to-week priorities prioritizes prayer for the nations? How much of your week-to-week priorities prioritizes prayer for the leaders of your government? Possibly persecution could be, and often is, God's cleansing, burning away of extraneous things that distract us from what he's called us to be as a people. Notice evangelistic prayer aims at religious liberty and is grounded in in the gospel of our God, verses three through seven. It's grounded in the gospel of our God. Paul says in verse three and four, such prayer pleases our evangelistic God, says this is good and is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Paul's saying strategic prayer for the globe and government leaders for the purpose of religious liberty has the authorized stamp of approval of God for his church's worship. In other words, it brings God great delight. Why? Because it reflects who he is. And who is he? He's the God who wants, who desires, who yearns for every class and every rank on the globe. That's what all people means. Without exception to know his saving power. So when we pray strategically, God, save the nations. That's the Great Commission call. This only just reflects how we're to pray for the Great Commission. And raise up leaders, Lord, and put men in place who guard freedom so that we can aggressively evangelize the nations. God says, yes, that pleases me because I want every tongue and I want every tribe and I want every nation to know me. I want you to be so undistracted in your laser-like focus to reach people for me. And he knows persecution, wow, wonderful, in many ways, and while so good, is not as effective for our strategy to reach the nations. This pleases God because he wants to save people. He yearns for this. And rather than being exclusively for one people, again, the Jews, our small little cult of a heretical sect, God is saying, Paul is saying about God that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's God's heart 
Notice in verse five and six, evangelistic prayer, we just look at pleases our evangelistic God. And evangelistic prayer, verse five and six, is grounded in our God. It's grounded, notice the word for. It's gonna give the reason or the basis for everything he just said. Paul gives the reason for all that he said thus far, and it's gospel theology. Everything that he's just said, now he's going to root in the soil of the gospel. Notice what he says. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. What's Paul saying? He's saying this God who calls me to instruct you to pray globally and for governor, government officials who yearns that every tribe and tongue and nation know his saving power is the only, the only, the one and only God who sent his son wrapped in flesh. That's why he says the man, Christ Jesus, second person of the Trinity, joined himself to flesh eternally. That's what he's saying. And why did he do this? So that he could give his son, I love, who gave himself for all peoples on behalf of. I love that preposition. It implies substitution. Your place. He gave him that he might die in the place you deserved. What's the place you deserved? It's like John Owen said. He died the death of death. What you deserve for all eternity, which was eternal conscious torment. The Bible calls it the second death. Jesus, in a matter of hours, soaked up the entirety of the second death on the cross so that you wouldn't have to eternally. Amen? That's such good news. That's what we deserve, to die eternally. I've seen people die. It's ugly. It's unending when you don't bow the knee to Christ. Christ took on our flesh and he defeated death. His death was the death of death. And that's why he wrapped himself in flesh and suffered as our ransom, the Bible says in these verses, under the wrath of God, which is why he is the only way to reconcile rebels to a holy God. He's a mediator. He alone can bridge the eternal chasm between our depravity and God's white hot holiness. He's the one and only meteor. There's one God and there's one savior. And this is why you need to pray and why you need to pray for government officials so that you're undistracted in your aggressive evangelism because this is why God sent his son to reach peoples all over the globe. He gave himself for all as a sacrifice on the cross is, is the very, it's the very motivation for our supplication for all global peoples and all government leaders so that when we pray for their salvation, verse six is saying, we are reflecting his very heart. His very heart. Never forget this. Doxological prayer. That's a fancy word for worship. Doxological prayer, Paul is saying, flows from a scripture-grounded theological gospel. In other words, local church worship shaped by God's word, impacts our evangelistic work. That's why what goes on in this pulpit does not affect just you. It affects the nations. It affects the governments of this world. 
Why? Because we preach a Christ whom the Bible says in Isaiah, the government is on his shoulders. And this is why liberal Protestantism has never, if you study its history, been marked by aggressive, global, evangelistic missions. If you study denominations, you should read Gray J. Gresham Machen's Christianity and Liberalism. He wrote that book 100 years ago because he saw liberalism making inroads into the church, anti-supernaturalism. We cut out all the supernatural parts of the Bible. We cut out hell. We cut out substitutionary atonement. And Machen said, no, no. And every denomination that does this shrinks. Their churches shrink. They have no global outreach or impact. All they're relegated to is basically economics, liberal education, gender equality, but never evangelism. Why? Because when you gut the gospel from the church, then Outreach to the nations and the neighborhoods dies. Paul says, God assigned me to communicate Christ to the heathen, verse 7. He basically says in this verse, he assigned me to communicate Christ to the heathen, and I preach this testimony that I just mentioned in verse 6, this, this gospel. I preach it, and I educate, instruct. The church has always been about education. That's why we start schools. That's why we're into homeschool, private schools. Out of churches come seminaries. Out of churches come universities. That's because to discipleship in its DNA is education. Education about what? Paul says, I preach this. I herald it to the lost, and I educate Gentiles. How? What do I educate them in? I educate them in the deep truths of the gospel to grow their trust in God, faith and truth. I want them to see Christ. He's like a diamond, and it's 66 sides. That's the 66 books of the Bible. And there is enough to drown in that for a lifetime to be eternal students and allow it to warm our heart that causes us to be on mission. Before we move on from these first seven verses, let me say something that occurred to me two nights ago when I was working on this sermon. Many in the Reformed crowd often try to explain away the heart of God for the lost in verse 4 who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. They, they are compelled in their commentaries and their equivocations to mention words Paul doesn't use in this text. Words like great words, theological words, biblical words, words like election, words like predestination, words like foreknowledge. As a, as a slobbering Calvinist myself, I say, stop. Stop doing that with this text. Let the text speak. Don't qualify the Spirit's message in it. And what's the Spirit's message? God wants congregations to pray with veins showing in their necks for the tribes of the unreached. Don't undercut it with something outside the text that, yes, is biblical. God's heart is for the peoples of the world. God wants churches all over the world to pray with God's heart for people. Get that in this text. He loves people. And it would seem to me that if we're reformed, we should take time to intercede for the globe and intercede for governments during this conference demonstrating by our prayer what we profess with our theology and what we profess. If you know this song, is this. You alone can rescue. You alone can save. 
you alone can lift us from the grave. You came down to find us, let us out of death. To you alone belongs the highest praise. See, it's out of our worship comes our mission. And it would seem to me, as we sing, I tell, I tell my people, let's sing from our toes. Let's sing with, if I started a rock band, and I wouldn't start a rock band, that'd be stupid. If I started a music group, I would title it Gospel Gusto. Right? Let's sing from our toes. And it would seem to me if we sing from our toes, the thought should cross our mind. It should cross our mind. We were made for this, this moment right now. This is what I was made for. And then when we have that realization, we can say, we can't keep this to ourselves. We're like those two lepers and kings who come into the camp. We're going to die, so let's go over there and maybe they'll kill us. We're, we got leprosy anyway. They go over there and there's this great victory that God drives out an enemy camp and they're like trying on clothes. You look sweet in that, dude. And they're eating legs of lamb. And then they're like, we can't keep this to ourselves. We've got to go tell others. Others need to know. Every missions conference should have this quote. It was quoted last night. I want to quote it again. Here's the spirit of what I'm trying to say. Missions is not the ultimate goal of the church. Worship is. Missions exist because worship doesn't. Worship is ultimate, not missions, because God is ultimate, not man. When this age is over and the countless millions of the redeemed fall on their faces before the throne of God, missions will be no more. It is a temporary necessity, but worship abides forever. Worship, therefore, is the fuel and the goal of missions. It's the goal of missions because in missions, we simply aim to bring the nations into the white hot enjoyment of God's glory. Missions begins and ends in worship. So tired mama, when you worship, you're affecting the nations. So it bothers me today that we have these bands in church and we have speakers so loud. You can't hear yourself sing. You need every Sunday morning to come in here and hear, according to Ephesians and Colossians, each other sing the gospel. How many of us have walked in on a Sunday morning, been depressed and down and disillusioned? I read Psalm 39 this morning and the ESV study Bible note said, God allows worshipers to come and say, I don't understand what's going on. Aren't you glad you have a God like that? And then you hear one another singing truths and your heart that's sluggish and doubting and maybe cynical and maybe want to walk away from it all is warmed by the gospel. He's preserving you through corporate worship. This is why in COVID we were all starving to be together again, to hear the word preached publicly, but to hear one another sing because I need that. I can't tell you how many Sunday mornings, even as a pastor, I've been wrestling spiritual warfare. I got a short night of sleep. Demons are all on my shoulder saying, this is dumb. Why are you doing this work? You're going to fail all sorts of lies. And I hear the people of God worship. And my whole heart just flips. And I'm ready to go. Unless we think this is all pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. Let's just do a quick flyover of... Verse 8 through chapter 3, verse 13, where Paul is saying, your ecclesiology influences your reach of the nations, your missiology. Your ecclesiology, that's the doctrine of the church, impacts, influences, has a direct correlation on your mission. 
One word links everything in verses one through seven with the remainder of chapter two and arguably all of chapter three. It's this word. This is why, this is why scholars and this is why evangelicals, that means gospel-loving people, have fought, had battles for the Bible as the Baptist did last century. It's because every little word of God is inspired. Notice that word then in chapter, excuse me, in verse eight. Then. Then is saying all the topics I'm going to address now in verses 8 through 15 will influence a local church's impact on reaching the nations. You know what reaches the, what affects the nations? Number one, our angry arguments among the men impacts missions. Verse 8, angry arguments among the men of the church impacts missions. Brothers, if you want to reach the nations for Christ, guard against ungodly conflict in your church. I've experienced this. It ripped my guts out. Satan is always seeking to divide the sheep to get them to distrust their shepherds for petty things often. He didn't call me back. He didn't text me. I texted him. Don't let that happen. He thinks he's so cool. He's read Grudem and he's read Erickson and he's read Bovnik. He thinks he's so awesome. Careful. Fight against that. Because your conflicts affect someone who's never heard in China, someone who's never heard in Russia, someone who's never heard in South America, someone who's never heard maybe in the mountains of Colorado. Number two, and let me say this, instead, brothers, it says, gather together to pray with postures befitting the king to whom you pray, lifting holy hands. Just a, a posture of gather together and pray. It's hard to continue to have conflict with someone you're praying with. Number two, the appearance of women impacts missions, verses 9 and 10. Sisters, if you want to reach the nations for Christ, forsake ungodly clothing and vain appearances. Do not bring the immodest, ungodly styles of the world into the church. Instead, what's the alternative? Enhance your beauty with grace and good works. The way you dress impacts global missions. Number three, rightly ordered authority impacts missions. Verses 11 through 15, I don't permit a woman to teach. Why? Two reasons. Silent doesn't mean they can never talk. Silence doesn't mean they can never pray. It's talking about teaching in the office of pastor, elder. Adam was formed deep first, then Eve. That's a creation president. And then it wasn't the, woman who, the man who was deceived, but the woman who was deceived. That's the fall. But pursue, what does he say? Let me just summarize it this way. Sisters, don't seek the pulpit to influence the world for Christ. Don't seek the pulpit to influence the world for Christ, but raise godly seed in a godly way. So much more could be said about that. Denominations that have gone the way of liberalism always start, one of the marks, is appointing women to the pulpit and women to the pastorates. And within a generation, they're appointing homosexuals. And they're the Protestant liberals that then don't impact the world. It's a step by step fade. And then chapter three, verses one through 13, basically we could summarize elders and deacons. These have to be men of character and competency, heavy on character, able to teach men and deacons who understand the gospel and gain a good standing. What is he saying here? The right men in authority impacts missions. So I want to encourage you, church, when we put biblically qualified men in leadership, the church will reach the world. I was thinking about Ken's influence on my life, Ray's influence on my life. So many 
men in this church and women have been impacted by godly elders who've been so faithful through the years. Robin Conroll, Brian Rutland, Robert Davis, others not serving anymore. And from their faithful service, a trajectory of people are going out. See, when local churches are biblically healthy, they will reach the world with the gospel. I close with this quote written by Machen, who wrote Christianity and Liberalism. Just, you will love this quote. This will warm, because this is Southside Bible Church. This is New Covenant Community Church. Listen to what he says. Remember, he was writing in a world of great tumult to 100 years ago. Is there no refuge from strife, he says? Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name to forget for the moment all those things that divide nation from nation and race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife, and to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross? If there be such a place, then that is the house of God. And that the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you. We worship, we're worshiping now over your word. Just like it said before creation, your spirit hovered before you started speaking the universe into existence. And we sense that now with your spirit who is hovering over the word about your son just as he hovered over him at his baptism. And I pray that you would send from this sermon and the sermons that are preached and have been preached at this conference, those that will take this gospel shalom to the ends of the earth for your renown. Not to us, not to us, O Lord, but to your name be the glory because of your love and your faithfulness. We ask all this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for that message, Ryan. Man, suburban cocoon. You know, the Rings of Power released a new episode last night on Netflix. But we're here today because we want to see God's glory. We're going to take a uh, break now uh, to get uh, the call set up. Um, when we come back for this call, we're going to ask that 
you not record anything, not take any pictures. Um, we'll be talking to Rodney. This is our Alpha One family who's in the Middle East. So just wanted you to be aware of that. And so we'll take a break until uh, we'll come back just before 1045.